<laughs> Welcome, and I'll hop off. Thanks Great. for joining. All right. So, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Cloudy with a Chance of Chaos. My name is Christina Yakiman, and I am the lead engineer on the Chaos and Resilience Engineering team at Vanguard. Today, I'm going to talk about what chaos engineering is, why we do it, and how we implemented our own custom tool for it over the past year and a half. We will start by defining what chaos engineering is. And I thought I would share some of the attempts that I've heard to define chaos engineering from folks who weren't quite sure what it was. This first one is the most common one that I hear and is probably the closest. That's breaking things on purpose. While it is true that at its core, chaos engineering involves fault injection. This one is just a little bit of an oversimplification. I mean, there's no one at Vanguard who's going to give me a pat on the back for breaking our production systems, that's for sure. How about this next one? I know it's something that Netflix does, but we could never do that here. Yes, the practice of chaos engineering did originate at Netflix, but just because we're not a tech company doesn't mean we can't leverage chaos engineering. Even in a highly regulated industry like financials, we absolutely can run chaos experiments. In fact, we already have. Isn't that just a fancy name for performance testing? It's another buzzword. This one's interesting because sending a ton of load at an application is one form of stress testing it. So I would agree that the two do go hand in hand, but chaos engineering encompasses so many more faults than just significant load. And this last one, I get a lot when I tell people my job title, even other folks within IT. Um, what the heck is that? And it's okay if this is still your level of understanding of chaos engineering. When I have to explain what it is, I typically say that chaos engineering boils down to resilience testing. If you're new to it, principlesofchaos.org is a great resource for those who are just getting started with chaos engineering. I'll actually borrow from their definition because I think it sums it up really well. Chaos engineering is the discipline of experimenting on a distributed system in order to build confidence in the system's capability to withstand turbulent conditions in production. So now that we've laid the foundation, set some context, hopefully you understand a little bit about what chaos engineering is, let's talk about why it's so valuable. As we're migrating to the cloud, we're becoming more and more comfortable treating our servers as cattle, not as pets, as the saying goes. And that's a good thing because infrastructure fails all the time. So we need to be prepared for that level of fragility. We're either relying on resilience mechanisms that come from our public cloud provider, like auto scaling or custom automation to ensure that we can self heal when faults occur. We should be testing those things. The last thing you want is to find out during a production incident that the way you thought you configured your self-healing mechanism, yeah, it doesn't quite work the way that you expected it to. And don't forget about the human aspects of your system. Chaos engineering is really great for those as well. Your incident responders and your engineers on call. Use chaos engineering to train these people in their new roles and help them practice reacting to failures. Make sure that the appropriate alerts are firing and also that the recipients of those alerts know what to do when they're being notified. So with pretty much this pitch, we were able to convince the IT leadership teams at Vanguard to let us try to get a chaos engineering practice off the ground. We were basically the equivalent of a fledgling startup internally. And so the very first question that we needed to ask ourselves was whether we were going to build or buy our solution for chaos engineering. Naturally, the first place that we looked was the open source community. It would be great if we could leverage a library or utility that was already out there. And there are plenty. So I would absolutely recommend that any company that is just starting out on their chaos engineering journey start here with the open source community. Unfortunately for us, a lot of the tools that we found didn't quite meet our needs. They 
mostly assumed that developers could SSH out to any server or target any device on the network with a CLI command run from their desktop. And for us, that's just not the case. We've got some really rigorous automated security controls in place at Vanguard, as you might expect. So there would have been a lot of upfront work required to integrate these libraries with our security tooling to the point that it just didn't make sense for us to use these tools. Instead, we looked at vendor products to see if any of those were a little bit more advanced in the security integrations that they offered. We found a couple, but they're few and far between, which means that they're pretty expensive. The companies that are producing these products are able to charge a lot because there aren't that many on the market. And since we didn't have enterprise-wide buy-in for chaos engineering just yet, no one was willing to foot the bill for such an expensive purchase up front. So we ruled that out, leaving us with one remaining option. We had to forge our own path and deliver a lean MVP to demonstrate value quickly and iterate from there. That's why we built the Climate of Chaos. Over the past year and a half, we developed the Climate Control Center web application that you see here. Not the most beautiful, but hey, it's an internal web app. It allows engineers at Vanguard to run experiments with weather-themed names, which we call phenomena, such as cyclone, drought, and tornado. These phenomena represent different types of faults that can be injected into a system across a variety of different platforms that are in use at our company including EC2, ECS, and RDS, just to name a few. When we first released the tool for internal use just a few months into development, we actually only had a couple of available options for experiments. But since then, we have grown to support 16 different fault injections. If a user selects Chaos Flash Flood, for example, an experiment that increases CPU utilization on an instance or a task for a period of time, they'll be prompted with this screen here to input just a few details about their infrastructure. And then they can run their experiment at the click of a button. It's really that easy. To explain how we designed it and built it, I will walk you through our four guiding principles that we had in mind throughout the development process. They are serverless, easy adoption, defined guardrails, and integrated reporting. I'm going to give each one of them some individual attention on the next four slides. First up is serverless architecture. Serverless was really important to us, both for the high availability of our product and low cost. Our web application that you saw the screenshots of, that's running in AWS ECS Fargate. The web app is actually the only component of our architecture that is not using a consumption-based pricing model. I'm going to talk about costs a lot on this slide, so I want to explain what I mean by that. Consumption-based pricing means that you are only paying for the tool when it's being utilized. With AWS ECS, we do have at least one task provisioned around the clock, so we're always paying for a little bit of compute but we are taking advantage of things like auto scaling to ensure that we are not paying for much compute and scaling to meet the demand when it's needed. We're using the Fargate option for ECS to reduce our operational complexity. It takes the guesswork out of VM provisioning and lets Amazon handle that for us. Our web app is Python based and it uses the Flask framework. This helps us to limit the number of different programming languages that our team needs to know and understand, which is honestly a huge help when onboarding new team members. We used to have major workloads in Node.js and Java and Python, and that just makes the team really difficult to hire for. And all of that context switching decreases our velocity. The backend experiment execution functionality is all built out with AWS Lambda using step functions. AWS Step Functions is a workflow management tool that pairs really well with our series of Python Lambdas. It allows us to introduce wait states into our system without having to pay for that idle time. Both Lambda and Step Functions operate on that consumption-based pricing model so we can keep our costs really, really low, increasing with the utilization of our platform. In example of one of our Step Functions that's a little bit more simplified would be 
stop the application, wait for a specified period of time, start the application back up, and then validate that it started successfully. This one will probably come as no surprise for folks who are familiar with AWS. For storage, we're using DynamoDB. Dynamo has two distinct pricing models, provisioned throughput and on-demand capacity. We're using on-demand pricing right now, which makes the expense for our Dynamo workload truly consumption-based. While we do pay more per capacity unit, we're paying significantly less overall due to the sporadic bursty nature of the traffic on our platform. Usage is currently relatively low, especially outside of business hours. And it's pretty unpredictable too, because we never know when one of our internal clients is going to pick up the tool and try to run a chaos experiment. The last component is AWS CloudWatch events, which we're using for scheduled invocations with cron expressions. These come into play to support scheduling of experiments for our clients so that they can run their experiments weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, et cetera, as well as for synthetically generating traffic through our step functions throughout the day to allow us to quickly detect any issues that may arise, whether that's based on a change that we've made or some other change that's happened in our environment that prevents us from injecting faults into the applications. Next up is easy adoption. I mentioned how small my team is. We didn't want teams to be submitting tickets to us before they could run their chaos experiments. So we've given all IT teams access to our tool so that they can self-service their experimentation. This is a much more scalable model for our small team that ensures our bandwidth won't ever become a bottleneck preventing broader adoption of the tool. I know this one might sound too good to be true, but it was probably the most important tenet that we set for ourselves building the climate of chaos. There are no code changes needed. We knew that these engineering teams were already so busy working on delivering critical functionality for the products that they support. If the barrier of entry was too high to start using our tool, then it would hinder the adoption of chaos engineering overall at Vanguard, and we definitely didn't want that. The most that a team would need to do to get started with the climate of chaos is make a couple of small configuration changes, probably about five lines in total. And in many cases, they just need to add one tag to their AWS resources and they are off and running. Now, I have never met an engineer who said that documentation was their favorite part of their job and my team is definitely no exception, but I am going to talk about the importance of a well-documented tool. Thorough, approachable documentation has been so critical to our success. By creating easy to understand user guides for our clients to pair with our self-service tool, we've been able to spend less time providing support and onboarding new users and more time doing the work that we really enjoy, which of course is developing new features. Naturally, if we have given access to all of IT to use this tool, then we're going to need some defined guardrails since we are still working in a regulated environment. To minimize the blast radius of the experiments that are being run, we prioritized single target experiments so that teams could get started right away without needing to chase down approvals from dozens of key stakeholders. When I say single target experiment, you can think of an EC2 instance or an ECS cluster, rather than doing something like taking out an entire AWS availability zone for a VPC or for an AWS account. We're lever leveraging tagging native to AWS to conditionally grant IAM permissions to our tool. This prevents fault injection from accidentally targeting infrastructure that hasn't opted into experimentation yet. So for example, if you have an EC2 instance in the non-prod environment, and I do too, and I want to run an experiment against mine, but I accidentally copy your instance ID out of the console instead of my own, my experiment isn't going to be executed because you haven't added the tag opting into experimentation to your instance. So the Lambda functions that power the fault injection do not have access to make any modifications to your EC2 instance. Your infrastructure is safe from my mistake. And this one might be a little bit controversial, but we are sticking to non-production only for now. 
I'll go into this in a little bit more detail at the end of my presentation, but at Vanguard, there are pretty significant security reviews that need to take place before any application goes to production. And for good reason, right? We need to protect people's money. But we wanted to have a quicker time to market for the internal users. So rather than going through that process, we delivered a tool to non-production so that they could run their experiments alongside their performance tests and other automated tests in the test region. Last but not least, we have integrated reporting. If you can't see how your system is behaving, your chaos experiment isn't going to do you any good. Fault injection is only useful when you can see the results. That's why we've provided functionality within our tool that allows users to set up steady state probes. We call this aspect of our tool radar, of course, in keeping with our weather theme. The probes send light but consistent traffic to an application's rest endpoint throughout the duration of an experiment. And it uses structured logging to provide insights about how the system's behavior is changing, if at all. We also created dashboards in Splunk with queries based on radar's structured logs so that teams wouldn't need to go searching for their experiment results. Upon executing an experiment, a dashboard URL is provided to the user that pre-populates all of the dashboard parameters based on the inputs they've already provided to the Climate Control Center. The link takes them directly to their results presented in a way that is easy to interpret with no need to write any custom queries. They can even compare the results against past experiments that have been run on the same target. It's important to note here that our goal was never to become a round-the-clock synthetic monitoring tool, nor were we trying to enable load testing. That's not really our lane as the chaos team. Radar is sending just enough traffic in the context of a chaos experiment to provide data about the system's behavior for analysis. So that's everything that we have done over the past year and a half, but I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about what's next for our team. Of course, we are going to continue to develop new phenomena. For example, starting in Q4 of this year and looking ahead into 2021, we're going to look to add support for applications running in AWS EKS as teams at Vanguard start to look at EKS as a great option for running their Kubernetes workloads in the cloud. We're also going to focus on coaching to encourage broader adoption. We've already gotten a lot of these self-starters and early adopters on board in the past year, but we want to dedicate some cycles to educating even more product teams at Vanguard about the value of chaos engineering. We'll make our sales pitch, get them on board as our clients, and in some cases, we'll even help them analyze their architectures to identify appropriate targets for fault injection. We do want to introduce some more complex tools that will require minor code changes. This is for those really advanced faults that we can't quite introduce without them. This feature is going to be targeted at our power users, the people who have already been using and loving our existing climate of chaos functionality and want to dive a little bit deeper. And more advanced automation and scheduling. I mentioned that we're using CloudWatch events with cron expressions. I would love to see us get to a point where this is a little bit smarter, maybe change-based. So your saved suite of chaos tests will run as soon as a new release is detected in the non-prod environment. A report could be generated, results could be compared against the previous test, and if there is any indicators that resilience may have decreased since the previous test, the application owners could be notified before they ever send their code to production. Now, there are two important things that you don't see on this list that I want to touch on as well. The first is bringing our chaos testing functionality to production. I promised earlier that I would talk about this at the end. At this point, the practice of chaos engineering at Vanguard just isn't mature enough to warrant the effort, but it's definitely on our long-term roadmap as a team. We see ourselves getting to that point eventually because testing in production is the most effective way to understand how production systems behave. No matter how production-like, your non-prod environments are. For now, we're going to continue educating teams on chaos engineering concepts and the fundamentals, and we'll deliver a production-ready tool suite down the road, just in time for teams to be ready to use it. The second thing that you don't see here is open sourcing the tool. 
This one is on my personal wish list, and there's still a small chance that we'll begin the process of open sourcing the climate of chaos in 2021, but we'll need more buy-in from our leadership teams first so that we can staff up and support that effort. So if you liked what you saw in this presentation, please feel free to send me your feedback. You can connect with me on LinkedIn or find me on Twitter at SRE Christina. I'll share that feedback internally with the IT leadership teams so that we can make an even stronger case for allocating additional resources to chaos engineering. With that, I want to thank you all for your time and attention. And I know we got a little bit of a late start, but I think I've got us caught back up. I know I'm the only thing standing between you and your lunch break, but I will open up the floor for any questions that you might have for me coming in via the chat. Uh, and if we get cut off here, then I will stick around in the chat for a little bit to answer your questions there. So uh, let me know if you've got any questions for me. A good question about the open source here. Um, in terms of outcomes we're hoping for, honestly, I'm, I'm hoping that other teams that are working in an enterprise environment will be able to leverage our tool if we do manage to open source it, which has that security first focus compared to some of the other ones that we found that had a fault injection first focus uh, and won't have to be stuck in that situation of I either need to drop a lot of money on a vendor product to get the security that I need, or I need to do a lot of upfront work. So hopefully it'll be providing an enterprise ready solution in an open source way. Plus, I would love to get some contributions from the open source community. Like I mentioned a few times, we're a very, very small team. So open sourcing the product would be beneficial to me as well, because it will allow my tool to grow a little bit faster in functionality that's available for the folks here at Vanguard to use. Ah, uh, yes, and as Kim mentioned, anyone who uh, wants to chat with Vanguard about opportunities, we've got recruiters at the Vanguard Expo booth as well. So you can use that uh, Expo tab in Hop In to, uh, to chat with Vanguard a little bit later in the day during your lunch break, maybe. All right, we're right at 11.30. So if any other questions come in in the next 15 minutes or so, I will stick around in the chat to answer them. Or like I said, you can reach out to me on Twitter at SRE Christina or on LinkedIn, Christina Yakiman. Pretty easy to find me. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Julie to send you into your lunch break. Thank you, Christina. And everybody, yes, indeed, it is your lunch break. So we at the Technically Developers Conference, we are going to um, take this break until 1 p.m. That's going to be the next case study. Um, but you should also use this time to visit the exhibitor booths. They are on uh, the left hand side of your screen that you should see in Hopin. Um, that's where a bunch of companies that are hiring have people who are representatives who are talking about company culture and different positions they've opened. So definitely check that out. Um, and again, we'll be back here at 1 p.m. for the next case study. Thank you for joining the Technically Developers Conference.